The Mechitza is a modern tradition pushed upon all Jews regardless of the traditions or beliefs of non-Orthodox Jews or even other Orthodox Jews. As I explained in Part 1, the Mechitza comes from the supposed separation of men and women during the water-drawing ceremony of Sukkot. Based upon the Talmud, Orthodox rabbis believe that the bounty in the temple was biblically ordained and therefore Orthodox Jews must not pray in a synagogue without a mechitza. There are some Orthodox rabbis who believe that the mechitza is an ancestral custom which cannot be changed. This balcony was made in the court of the women, a place where men and women were both permitted without a barrier between them. This was the furthest a woman could travel on the Temple Mount. It can be safely assumed that before the balcony was built, men and women worshipped together in this court without a mechitza or other barrier. In addition, during certain times of the year, especially Yom HaKippurim or Yom HaTurah, the smaller woman's court would not be able to contain all the worshippers, which meant the outer court, known as the Court of the Gentiles, was utilized by worshippers where there was no indication of a mechitza. There are late 19th century drawings and early 20th century photographs of men and women worshipping at the Kotel without a mechitza. When Rabbi Rabinowitz is asked about the photograph showing men and women praying without a mechitza, he rejects this argument, stating that the photographs are meaningless since the Kotel wasn't under Jewish sovereignty. They couldn't read Torah or blow the shofar, he said. They could hardly pray there. The British did terrible things. You want to go back to that? The British didn't establish local custom. However, if one goes back further in time to the Mishnaic and Talmudic period, one will also find no archaeological basis for assuming the existence of a separation between the genders. The first mention of separation of men and women occurs toward the end of the Geonic era in the 11th century CE. But from this point onward, there is only a passing mention of such separation. It was not until the end of the 19th century that a halachic source requires the separation of genders in the synagogue. The Mishnah, Tosefta, and Babylonian Talmud all state that the erection of the balcony in the temple was a rabbinic enactment and it tells us nothing about the synagogues. There is, however, considerable evidence of mixed prayers in the Bible and in the Apocrypha. With references to the Second Temple period, many sources indicate that mixing was the norm in the women's court. Some in the Orthodox world will argue that women simply did not attend synagogue, so there was no need for separate seating. This argument is not supported by archaeological or literary evidence. In fact, there are plenty of proofs that women did in fact attend synagogue. According to the Talmud Bavli, there was a halakhic ruling that a non-Jewish woman could help prepare a meal until the Jewish woman of the household returns from the synagogue. According to the Tosefta, women are mentioned as being included among the seven people called to read Torah on Shabbat. In addition, the Jerusalem Talmud tells of a woman from Tiberias who went to synagogue every Friday night. In the 4th century, there is a Christian source from John Chrysostom, which mentioned women attending synagogue. The separation of men and women in the synagogue developed centuries after the temple was destroyed. There is no archaeological evidence of a woman's section in any synagogue of antiquity. In addition, even though there are many synagogue inscriptions of the time naming various areas within the synagogue, There has been no evidence found stating that a part of any ancient synagogue was used to separate women from their fellow male worshippers. The majority of these synagogues had a single prayer hall, but no balcony, and even for those few that had a balcony, there is no reason to assume that the balcony served as a woman's gallery. The balcony, even according to rabbinic sources, may have functioned as a meeting space, a place for the Beit Din or Rabbinic Court to practice, meals, study, or even a Hazan's or Cantor's living quarters. Out of all the traditions in Rabbinic literature that address the synagogue, not one mentions a woman's section. 
The only rabbinic source that mentions a separation is the balcony years during the water drawing ceremony of Sukkot. However, it appears from this place in the Talmud that during the other times of year, men and women mix together in this portion of the temple. With all this evidence, why does Rabbi Rabinowitz defend the Mechitza at the Kotel? I would dare to say that the issue is one of following man-made traditions, which are treated as actual mitzvot. However, why does the rabbi and those at the Western Wall Heritage Foundation refuse to listen to reason? In addition to following man-made traditions instead of Tanakh, I would say it is due to the fact that the rabbi and those at the foundation have the power given to them by the government to turn the Kotel into a Haredi synagogue. The body which has been given the keys of the Kotel by the Israeli government is a non-democratic, non-elected body, said Leslie Sachs, Women of the Walls director. It's not a body that gives any kind of representation to world Jewry or Israeli Jewry. They have turned the Kotel into a Haredi synagogue. Nowhere in the Tanakh is there a command to separate men and women during public worship or assemblies. Assemble the people, the men and the women and the little ones, and your stranger that is within your gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Eternal One your God and observe to do all the words of His law. Deuteronomy 31 verse 12 And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. Ezra 8 verse 2